uh, this is an Indian uh, 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 stone walls, stone chambers and such. But uh, the oddest one of all of them that we study is this building right here, and nobody knows who built it. So uh, underneath each of these pillars is three and a half tons of stone that goes four feet down to bedrock. Giant pile of stone that's made of giant boulders goes down four feet. And there's a giant pile that's about eight feet and wide on the outside and then tapers up to four feet underneath each of these uh, stone pillars. So about half what the stone you see here under the ground you don't even see. How do we know that? In 1950 they did an excavation right here, dug all the way down four feet. I've seen pictures of it. And when they were doing it, they found out that these drums that you see at the bottom, right now they're, they're uh, about six to eight inches of height. You see them, they're actually a foot and a half high. As they brought in dirt from the various gardens over the years, it's raised the level of this dirt up. So you don't see that this has giant elephant feet on them. Beautiful classical building. And then uh, there are the eight pillars. This is the west pillar, that's the east pillar. Come on in, gather it close in here so you can get a little bit closer to, to see you know, the west pillar, the east pillar. Above each, you'll see a beam socket. It's about one foot by one foot square. And those held beams that, uh, that came across, those two came across to here, those two went across that way, made a tic-tac-toe pattern like this. So this is the first floor, which is right at the height of the arch. You see, that's the height of the floor on the inside, right there at the top level of the beam sockets. Above that, you'll see a fireplace that uh, it has three unusual features. Uh, first, it has two flues. One goes up the upper right side, and one goes up the upper left side, and right in the middle, up on the second, above it, you'll see a beam socket. That's a beam socket for the second floor. There's another one there. Those two beams came across this way, and there's a running mortise that runs around the whole end tower, top of the tower. So that is the level of the second floor. So this is a room, and in this room is this fireplace that is uh, strangely built up on the wall. You see, that's the level of the, uh, the, the floor. <coughs> so there's a wall fireplace. In colonial houses, the hearth is always right on the ground. That's very unusual to see this at all. Uh, the main uh, uh, weird part of this is that it uh, has an arch above it as opposed to a lintel. You'll see a flat lintel on most fireplaces in New England. On the right side, it's well supported, but on the left side, right where it needs all the support, they put the window there. You see that architectural detail? Da, 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 da. And they jammed the window right there. Why didn't they move the window a little bit left? Why did it need to be there? Well, it's a very important clue. There are also these niches that go halfway into the tower. There's one there, another one off to the right, and several others. The entire tower is made out of granite. That's this, uh, this pinkish stuff, and then this is blue stone, this bluish stuff, and then this is slate. But there's one stone that's most unusual. We call it the sunstone. It's a round reddish rock about the size of a bowling ball. It's right in front of you. Let's see if you can see the sunstone first. There? Yes, the back row always oh. finds it first because it's up above us. Now, this is a nice time to look at it. If you move your head back and forth, you'll see that it has little crystals in it. It has this, this beautiful pink, uh, pink uh, crystals inside of it. And beneath it is a stone with cut shoulders, which I claim was made by man. You don't find stones like that around. So I showed this to the people that think this was built by the Templars. We get some Templar enthusiasts here in the back. And, and Scott Walters, in, 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 and he said, oh, that's the Templar symbol, the, uh, the, uh, the Keystone, the Keystone State, Pennsylvania. And I said, Scott, I gave you four reasons why it's not a Keystone. First off, it's not in the center of the arch. It's off to the right. No good mason put an offset or Keystone. Second, there's no other Keystones in any other interior, exterior arches. Third, this is not exactly ashlar construction where all the stones are pre-built. Pre and the V in the middle, that's what a keystone is. And the fourth reason has to do with the stone that's directly behind this on the interior. You see, this tower is about three feet thick. When we get to the other side, I'll show you that stone. Now, uh, let's go around the tower, and I'll point out the three windows. This is the west window, and it's slaves. See, the sides go in and out. And it's the only one that has a relieving arch above the lintel. It's, it takes some of the pressure off of it. Well, this is about two feet above the level of the floor. Look at that window in there. Six, about six feet above the level of the floor. That's the northeast window. Now, that's so high, you can't even look about, look through it. And that one's so low, you gotta bend over and look through it. What up with that? And so, uh, underneath it, you'll see these slots. These are stair steps that once led from the first floor to the second floor. There were more of them in the 1800s when they drew the first uh, pictures of this, but they've since done a little cementing work on the interior. Those have been lost. So that's how you get around to the second floor. But how do you get to the first floor? Where's the stairs to get up? You know, there's no stair steps and never were any. Uh, they've done, uh, you know, excavations and, and, and ground uh, penetrating radar. And there's nothing. So you needed a ladder to get up. And I claim they went up through the, uh, the middle of the, uh, uh, the whole trap door in the center of it. They had a ladder. And this is sort of like protective, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but also, this was uh, a sacred building 
Anyway, uh, let me point out three other uh, interesting features. This is a triangular rock that is above this uh, somewhat keystone. Again, that's not a keystone. It's, 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 it's not V'd at all. And if that was part of the keystone, that should be upside down. It doesn't work that way. The Viking people will tell you there's a description on the tower. They refer to these three rock lines right here. One, two, three. They claim that reads November 20th, 1120. But to me, it reads a couple scratches on a rock. But I let everybody have their own idea of what they want here. And uh, when the Viking theory came about in the 1850s, that's why the Viking Hotel is named such, and the Viking football team, and Viking Cleaners, and Viking Tuxedo, because eh, it sounds romantic, you know, and, and Longfellow wrote a poem about it. Third stone that's of interest is this black stone right here. This is a, called a, a piece of Cumberlandite. It's only found one place in the world, Cumberland, Rhode Island. And it is not, it, it, there was not a volcano right there, but the magma came up and it hardened. And uh, it has a high iron content to it, so you take a magnet, boom, it will stick right to it. And it's very heavy, and some of the pieces wash down the, the bay from the glacier, so you do find them around here, but most of them you find up in Cumberland. But this is on the exact north-south line of the tower. You see, this is the south pillar, uh, and it's not exactly in the middle of it, but the entire tower is off axis by three degrees counterclockwise. That puts this on the exact north-south line of the tower. So the people who put this in here, it's the only piece in the tower, they knew about magnetism, and that wasn't, uh, didn't learn about that until around the 1800s. Here is the south window, and this window is about four feet above the level of the floor, and it's about two feet high. And it's also splayed. See the sides go in and out like that. It does not have a relieving arch, it just has a black rock above it. But all three windows, come on over here, I'll show you the northeast window. All three windows are different sizes, different proportions, different height above the ground. Why would they have this asymmetry of the windows when they have this perfect symmetry of the arches and pillars down below? Now this is the northeast window, and it's the only one that's not splayed. It goes straight in on both sides, except on the left side, it tapers in a little bit. That's to accommodate the arch of the fireplace on the interior. It does not have a relieving arch, it just has that small little uh, stone above it. And if you go way up to the top, there's a white rock, and just above the white rock is a black hole. That is one of the flues of the fireplace. And if you go eight feet over to the left, uh, you can barely see the second flue over there. So the fireplace is in this region on the interior. Now come on and gather so you can look through this uh, arch, arch here, and I'll show you some stuff about the interior of this uh, of, the, of the thing. Some details. Come on, gather right around here because we got a lot of people who want to be able to see it. First people right up to the 30 years. He found these astronomical alignments in the windows of the tower. He studied this tower for thousands of hours, and he says, if you come here on the winter solstice, the sun comes up behind that flagpole over there, shines through the south window, through the tower, through the west window, and you can observe it from the northeast corner of the park. Sure enough, it happens like clockwork every year, only on uh, the solstice or a couple days before or a couple days after. And so uh, we call that the sun alignment. Now, after the beam of light shines through both windows, this patch of light coming through the south window works its way down. It's one foot, uh, no, about one foot wide by two feet tall. And uh, about an hour and a half after that first alignment, it illuminates this egg-shaped rock. It's like a spotlight, boom, right on the rock. And uh, again, you'll notice that this stone is not uh, uh, in the center of the arch. It's not a keystone. Look right behind it, the stone right there. That's the sunstone and the stone with shoulders. Whoa, come on. Whoa. That's exciting. Someone's trying to tell us something about light and time. Now, you'll see on this pillar right here, a white plaster, the giant patch of white plaster. There's more on that pillar there. It's in the beam sockets. It's in the, the entire tower. It was once covered with plaster inside and out. You didn't see any of these stones. Like, oh, that beautiful old rusted look. It's the same material that they use here. It's crushed sand, uh, uh, crushed uh, seashells, the slate heated up and, and, and mixed with uh, sand, freshwater sand, not salt water, and uh, otherwise it wouldn't have lasted, and, and gravel. And this is the original mortar right here, but it used to cover the entire thing. You can see it on, on some of the rocks, little pieces all over the place. So this is all plastered, and people say, well, why would they do that? Well, in medieval and renaissance times, you had a technique called scrafito, where they would plaster or something over and then full paint it with marble or and make it look like marble or brick or stone. It lines, full lines, the whole thing. This would have been heavily decorated. If you go to Prague or Venice today or these places, you'll see that there's writing on the wall and inscriptions, the whole thing. So you might say, oh, Jim, that means all your special rocks would be covered up. Well, indeed they were, but the people who built this tower, they wanted to build a tower that, 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 that hid the clues for posterity, and they knew if the tower fell into disrepair, 
there, that these clues would still be in there, and maybe a group of people from, from Sawam, some historians, would come down someday and figure the whole thing out. That's you guys. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, I'll tell you a couple more things, but we're going to go see the uh, alignment site, which is down at this tree here. As we pass by the northern side, you'll notice that there's two small windows on the north side, and, and we call these uh, uh, just little uh, pinhole windows, one there and one up higher. I'll explain what those are in a little bit. But first, I'll show you the summer line down here. That's this little tree right here. Her, and it doesn't matter the height or anything, because you'll be able to see over people's shoulders. <laughs> What's your name? Lindy. Okay, we're going to be fine, Lindy. And so, and so uh, if you look up this way, you'll be able to see through the west window, through the tower, and you'll see right through the south window. See the little patch of sky, everybody? Mm -hmm. Well, now on that day, the winter solstice, the sun comes up above the horizon. You might have to get in. Can you see through the sky? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see right through the tower and see a patch of sky. The winter solstice, the sun comes up and boom, shines right through that little hole in between it. So the light shines all the way down this row here. And then it makes a low arc behind that steeple in the winter, it's as low as it is. In the fall and spring, it's much higher in the sky, it does not go through the hole. And in summer, it's really high. It starts way here at Mill Street, and you can see it's almost, we're getting towards the June uh, sol sol solstice, and it sets way over here. So this marks the southernmost rising of the sun every year. And so what's unusual about these two windows, the west window and the south window, that's different from the other window? Pop quiz, see if you've been listening to me. These are the two that are splayed. The sides go in and out like that. Well, the tower is three feet thick, and so if they weren't splayed, you would not have a line of sight to be able to see through the tower. You might say, well, maybe it was for bow and arrows, Jim. Well, bow and arrow slits, if you've ever been to England, they're only open on one side, and they're also very thin. Uh, but this one here is open on two sides, and it's right here. You don't want to be standing in front of that window if somebody's shooting arrows. Come on over here, I'll show you the moon alignment. It has to do, uh, Professor Penthollow found this said if you come here on December 26, 1996, on that one day out of every 18.6 years, an event called Lunar Minor, he says you'll see the full moon right through these two windows. Well, he wrote about it in 1990, and, and, and in 1996, uh, I, well, I read about it, and, and I said, well, I'm going to come here and see. I was a professional photographer in Providence for 40 years, so I came here, set up my, tri prod, uh, tri my tripod right here. Come on around so you can see this alignment. If you don't, if you don't get to here, you won't see it. And you'll see right straight through the west window, through the tower, through the northeast window. I came here, and sure enough, the full moon appeared right through those two windows. And then happened again 18.6 years later in 19, uh, in um, 2015, and won't happen again until 2033. So this tower was built for this archaeoastronomy. Architecture involves the sun, the moon, and the stars. And all uh, uh, cultures throughout the world, throughout history, have been interested in, in uh, archaeoastronomy, except one. Stupidos Americanos. What do we need that for? We got cell phones. Yeah. Oh, come on. Right. So this building is a horologium, a building that keeps track of time. And it's a very special thing. I'll show you one more alignment, and then we'll go into the museum. Because we don't have a long time today. You can see I have a lot to say. I'm going to try to talk fast. She's keeping up with me. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so uh, what we Professor Penthollow is about 86 years old. He lives in Charleston, Rhode Island, and, and I see him, I talk to him once a week. He's a very nice guy. Um, but, uh, and so if you stand here and look through the south window and right through the tower, you'll see right through a small uh, aperture on the north side. Can you see all of that? Yeah, yeah. Well, he found out that uh, this bright star Dubbe, D-U-B-H-E, which is in the bowl of the Big Dipper, it's the brightest star, it's the one that, that astronomers and navigators use for, for navigating, it points to the north star, which is exactly uh, 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 six lengths exactly past it. So he found when the dubby is, uh, it, it comes through and is seen through here, then the north star is at its exact north position in the sky. It doesn't go, it's not exactly north all the time, it goes around the dark points in the sky. So this is a, a exact true north for, uh, so somebody wanted to connect heaven with earth. This is the sun, the moon, and the stars all aligned in this building. Well, that's not that unusual. This is what church spires do, connecting heaven with earth. But Professor Penhollow uh, said this is unusual that they would do it through the window alignments. And he said the people who built this tower probably built the interior as a camera obscura solar disk calendar room. What's that? you got to come to my museum to find out. <laughs> uh, I'll show you one more alignment, then we'll go to the museum. Okay, this one here, there's a small aperture at the bottom. That's one of the two windows.
window to the north side. If you stand in that churchyard over there, look through this window, through that one there, you see the top of Myantinomi Hill, which is the highest point in, uh, in, in Newport. It's about two or three miles away. You won't see it today because the houses and such are built. Um, but uh, uh, but it, it does align perfectly north-south. So that is a land, a, a land a sighting. That is a, a sky uh, a alignment. That is the sun alignment, and that is the moon alignment. There's only four ways to look through the windows because you cannot see through these two windows because that one's not displayed, and each one of them is a major celestial event. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> Who built it? Come on into the tower of the museum. Let's find out. The Templars in 1398. The Chinese in 1421. Uh, the, the Portuguese in 1501, and the first governor of Rhode Island calls this his stone-built windmill in the year 1677. Well, this is what I have a thing about, is that uh, the first governor of Rhode Island was not only appointed by King Charles in 1663 to be the first governor of Rhode Island, he was re-elected seven times when he died, a thousand people attended his funeral. Raise your hand if you can tell me the name of the first governor of Rhode Island. <laughs> you can't tell. See, uh, and, and it's, not, it's not your fault, by the way. He's been buried in, in the history books. Is there a university? Nope. 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 No. Uh, the first governor of Rhode Island was named... Benedict Arnold. Benedict oh. Arnold. Not the traitor, but his great-great-great-grandfather. Oh. Five generations apart because his name is Benedict Arnold. They throw him out around history. Yeah. Oh. And it wasn't, you knew, historian that it was done in 1924. Roger Williams seemed like the guy, and they crowned him king of Rhode Island, founder of Rhode Island. Well, don't get me started, but Roger Williams was a nice guy, and he did a lot of nice things. He wrote a lot. The reason we know a lot about Roger is that he uh, uh, he wrote to John Winthrop Sr. in Boston, and he had a big trunk, and he saved all the letters. So we got all the letters. Everybody else's letters kind of got destroyed. Uh, in fact, none of Roger's, well, they burned Roger's house down, the Indians did. So so this guy, uh, well, come on in here. I'll show you, explain more about Benedict Arnold. I get you. Yeah, come on and welcome to the Newport Tower Museum. Yeah. So we're going to start over here. This is my list of the four theories. And um, the, the Benedict Arnold of 1677 in his will. But if you look at his will, if you uh, come on in a little closer here so you can see what's going on. It's up at the John Carter Brown Library and it says my stone built windmill. And uh, he, uh, but there's five asterisks around it, almost like. Oh, maybe it's not exactly the wind. Maybe he might be uh, uh, telling a little bit of a fib, which sometimes politicians do. I don't know if you guys know that. You know. <laughs> anyway, uh, and he might have reason that he wanted to, to to call it a windmill to hide to hide his knowledge about who built it. By the way, he uh, is buried a block away. You go down Pelham Street, his burial ground, the Arnold burying ground. He uh, he had a mansion on Thames Street, the governor's mansion, and he owned Bowen's Wharf across the street. He owned Goat Island. He owned the whole southern half of Jamestown, from the city of Jamestown all of the way, Beaver Tail, the whole thing, and he had a farm in West Kingston. These are all on a line, this guy, Benedict Arnold. He was one of the first ones here. Anyway, you'll see that the tower is perfectly circular from this helicopter shot, and before these houses were built, it had a view of the entire bay. You see these houses here kind of block the view nowadays, but you can see Goat Island and Jamestown. And there's the two uh, floors. First floor, second floor, the fireplace, and the three windows. The what, northeast, the west, and the south. Here's Professor Penhollow with his astrolabe. He says if you stand here, look through these two windows once every 18.6 years, you see the full moon. There it is, full moon. Right happened to be between the whole thing. And then it happened again, as I said, in 2015, in, uh, in, in and won't happen until 2033. And then the sun alignment, he says you stand here, look through these two windows. Uh, and, and right through that space that we showed you, and sure enough, the sun comes up and appears right through the, the hero was six years ago, five years ago, for the last, the last part. So the professor is given a lecture, and he says the interior acts like a camera obscura solar distance pilot room. I can explain what that means, but you're going to stand over at this corner of the museum for right now. Okay. And, uh, and what I'm going to do is close the room up. Camera obscura means dark room, in black, in a dark room with one small hole. The image of what's outside appears on the interior. So this is the aperture we're going to use. Uh, I'm going to have just you come, come on over right come on right in here. Dave, you can go right into here. You get the, a better view this way. And this is uh, just a piece of cardboard. And what you see when I close the door and, and turn off the light is the image of what's happening outside on Bellevue Avenue as we speak, projected onto this board. So 
So you can get closer if you want to look at it. But this is a camera obscura image. In other words, I turn this room into a giant camera. That's the lens. That's the film plane. And, uh, and you get this image on there. It's full color, full video. Look at the cars driving by. You'll see people walking by, people walking dogs. Why is it upside down? Well, the reason is light travels in a straight line. It bounces off all the objects outside. And then that reflected light has to get into here. See the people walking? has to get in here. Well, the light from up above, that's going to come down, and that'll be down here. The light from below, uh, the sidewalk and, and, and the flowers, that's going to be up here. So all the light rays crisscross. Everything on the right is on the left, left is on the right. And you'll see the image fills the entire room. It's on the floor, it's on the ceiling, the whole thing. This is the, the flag that's flying outside. It's kind of blocking this here. This goes the car. Now, uh, you brought with you today, each of you, two, uh, two camera obscuras. You know what they are? Eyes. Your eyes. Each and eye is a camera obscura. And this is how we see. Your brain flips things over. The lady walking by here. And so um, the professor, when he was giving the lecture, he said the interior was all plastered with white. We know that because you can see the plaster. This is what was going on inside the tower. Now, why would he say that? To see the enemy? No, it's just a lot easier to, to stick your head out the window or look right straight through. You know, they put that on upside down. And, and uh, in order to show you, I'm going to make another camera obscura, and this one just has a, a hole, an aperture. That one had a lens, but this is just a hole in a room. And the hole in any room, any place in the world, you'll see the image of what's happening. The smaller the hole, the sharper the image. So we'll go to the smaller hole here, and then you'll see that it's a little bit sharper. Whoops, I'm getting a secondary image here. And so uh, let's go to the smallest hole. That's the best one. If you want to come closer, you're more than welcome to. But this is the image of what's happening outside. See the trees, and this is the sky. What's that bright spot right there? Why is it brighter there than any place else? The sun. It's the image of the sun. It's in the sky, right? You see the clouds and such? Well, when you come down, you'll see that that makes a, a circular spot on the floor, uh, right there, right hitting this edge right here. There it is, right there. It's called the solar disk. It's the image of the sun in the camera obscura. Now, when I come in in the morning, this image of the sun, the solar disk, is over here at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. See, it's a little past 2 o'clock. It's hitting right about here, 3 o'clock. In the, in the winter, when the sun's much lower in the sky outside, the solar disk is way up here in the room at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4. And on the equinox, March 21st and September 21st, it goes across the center. So not only can you tell the time of day, uh, these lines, but you can also tell the day of the year. Every year, every day, it will move down. Here we are getting into summertime, that's why it's over here. So it's a calendar and a clock, and, it, and it's also an inside-out sundial, and it's also uh, a, a giant camera. Here is a 4 by 5 inch camera, and that's the image on the ground glass of the back of the camera. Well, I was a professional photographer, you can see the sun is right in the corner here. And I, uh, I used one of these cameras for 40 years, so I said, well, if I study the history of the camera obscura, I'll be able to figure out who built the tower, and that's how I was able to figure out who built the tower when nobody else could. <laughs> All right, so who built the tower, Jim? Well, what I did first off was, uh, in my photography studio, uh, I built a replica of what the tower looked like, and every day I would draw a circle where the sun was at the end of the day. The solar disk would work its way up the wall, and, and I drew these circles on the wall uh, every minute, and so I had the path that it took. And then the next day it moved over here, and so I followed it for an entire year. And in summer the sunset was right here, and then in winter it was here, and in, in spring it was right in the middle. So uh, I made a camera obscura, uh, uh, I, I correlated all of that with the data of the interior of the tower, and found some interesting things. Uh, let me just turn the lights on in here, stay right here. So uh, the main thing that I found out about the camera obscura is that the history goes back to the Greeks. Aristotle talks about them, and then uh, the Chinese in the Middle Ages, they said the light behaves like or an orlock. Everything is backwards. And then in 875, they used it to, um, to make, make calendars. In, in, uh, in France, this monk named Helperic, uh, he made a calendar by doing the same thing that I was doing in the afternoon in the morning, uh, watching the sun where it came through a hole on the west eastern side drawing a circle. But the main use was in the Renaissance when they converted these giant cathedrals into camera obscura rooms. This is Maria degli Angeli, a uh, uh, cathedral in Rome, interior done by Michelangelo. Come on around here so you can see this beautiful thing here. And so <coughs> uh, down, they put an aperture up at the top, and then down at the bottom a noon line, a meridiana line, just like I had there, exactly north-south, and every day of the, of the year is marked off on it. And, uh, and, uh, and <coughs> 
And this guy just wrote a book, David uh, Heilbronn, uh, John Heilbronn, he, he, The Sun in the Church, Cathedrals as Solar Observatories, one of the greatest astronomers in America. He writes all about it. Anyway, I'm watching with the sun cross on the summer solstice, on the equinox, and on the winter solstice, and counting the number of days, they were able to prove to Pope Gregory the Thirteenth that the Julian calendar that Julius Caesar had invented was out of sync from the sun, leading to the Gregorian calendar reform of 1582, the calendar we still use today. And <coughs> Uh, da Vinci says, you'll see everything upside down, and so it is with the pupil. They knew about the eye in, in the Renaissance, and then Gemathrisius, he's the first one to draw a picture of the camera obscure in 1544. And then uh, Cardano says, use a lens, you make things even sharper. They knew about lenses back then. Um, uh, Florence was the great uh, lens making center. And then and the only guy in England who knew about uh, the camera obscure, or at least wrote about it, was a guy by the name of John Dee. Anyone heard of John Dee? D-E-E, -E, last name. Uh, he was one of the Queen's advisors. And he shows an eclipse of the sun in 1583. And then in the 1700s, they use it as a drawing aid. Artists like Vermeer and Canaletto. And then in the 1800s, they put film in the back, made the first photographs. Then you get box cameras, the Leicas and Nikons. And now we take pictures of our cell phone. That's the way camera obscuras work. So as I was studying the history of optics, I was also studying the history of Benedict Arnold. Came here with his father in 16. Uh, 35, the exact same month that Roger Williams was here. He and Roger both signed the original deed for Providence. And here is uh, the tax list for, for uh, 50, 1650. He paid more taxes than anybody. He paid 10% of the whole town's taxes. Why? Because he was became the main trading factor between the Narragansett tribe and the people of Boston when this guy by the name of John Oldham had died. He took over, and, uh, and he had a three-day trading route. I claim he was in Providence, or Patuxet, where his family was, and then uh, Providence the first day, Nantucket the next, and then Boston. And they had a fleet of shallops where they traded all the Indian corn, thousands of bushels of Indian corn, furs and goods, and brought back guns, liquor, and ammunition that they sold to the, uh, to the, to the Indians, made a huge bundle of money. And then uh, uh, Roger Williams was the first uh, president of the colony, but he didn't like being managing people. He didn't want to do it. And so, uh, and so they got Benedict Arnold to do it, and he was uh, president for four, uh, four terms. And then uh, he was appointed by King Charles to be the first governor of Rhode Island. He go up to the state house that has his name right on the edict there for first governor. And then he was reelected seven times. And when he died, a thousand people attended his funeral. Uh, after a while, the, the Quakers moved into town. Um, but he was the one that defended all of these people that, uh, to have freedom of religion in Rhode Island. And people said, oh, no, it was Roger Williams. I'm like, no, the Jews, the Sabbatarians, the Quakers, they didn't go up to Providence. They, they didn't, all came here. In fact, Roger Williams debated against the Quakers. He had a big uh, event. He didn't, you know, uh, Roger Lo wrote a lot, but this guy was the man that was doing the work. He was the guy in charge. And so uh, he also owned all the land from Church Street, which is where we are now, just uh, or all the way around to Brenton Cove. And so, uh, aside from his other properties, and I found out he knew about the astronomical alignments in the tower. How do I know? In 1930, uh, they found his chair, and uh, on the side of it, or this is his design with three circles, one, two, three. And so I studied it, and I found out that he, uh, that these were carved into the original chair. This is a replica of the chair, which is at the Redwood Library. It's never been shown. Why? Because it's Benedict Arnold. We don't have to tell the whole story about Benedict Arnold. They'd be scared. So at the end of the day, if this was standing in front of the fireplace, <clears throat> the image of the sun, the solar disk, would be exactly that size. It varies, the solar disk, depending on how far in these churches, the solar disk was a foot wide. And in mine, it's about an inch wide, but in a camera obscura, the size of the diameter of the tower, it's exactly that size. So I'm like, this guy knew. But he was a merchant. He was a colonial guy. He wouldn't have known the sophisticated astronomy in here. And then one day, serendipity happened. You know what that means? Something lucky. I'm in the library, and I saw this book, and it says, Historical Names from Narragansett Bay. In 15, come on over here and take a look at this. 1527, Verrazano came here, and he called it Refugio, a place of refuge for an entire navy. And then the Spanish called it the Bay of Santa Bautista. And then, uh, this, and then I saw this listing, John D. Bay and River, 1583. John D. Bay and River? The Narragansett Bay? Why would he mean him after an Englishman, 40 years before the pilgrims came here, and the only Englishman who knew about the camera obscura? So I started studying about John Dee. He was an astronomer, mathematician, expert on navigation and cartography, foremost navigation guy. He, he was navigated for all the great Elizabethan explorers, and a library of 4,000 books. This is John Dee's library catalog. He wrote down every book that he owned in 1583, all the greatest Greek, Roman, largest library in England. He was the Queen's advisor. Have you ever seen Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett? There is uh, Elizabeth and her two top advisors. That's D right there, top guy. And he uh, wrote these eight books in 15, 
77, telling her she had a legal right to all of North America because King Arthur, Prince Atmatic, and John Sebastian Cabot had been to the New World and claimed it for England. And in this book, he, co he coins the term the British Empire, later became the largest empire the world's ever known, first person to use it. And he encouraged her to open up trade with, with, uh, with China and Japan through the Northeast and Northwest passages. And in this book, he says that she should build a navy of 60 to 80 large ships because Spain had a fleet of 200 ships, England only had 20. And he said, if we don't have any good navy, ain't going to be no more England. So uh, uh, the queen uh, takes his advice. This is the front cover of his book. Come on around here so you can all see this. Come on, see, see this. And, and there's the queen guiding the ship. Of, come on around so you can you see. Come on, sit right up. Uh, there's the queen guiding the ship of state to the new world. Five ships have come in into this river. They started trading, and the city has developed. I sent forth a sailing expedition to build a steadfast watch post written in Greek, Lady Occasion. And this is a, a God, the sun, the moon, and stars. Everything's aligned. And so uh, he calls it hieroglyphicon Britannicon, a British hieroglyphic. Pluralatin, more is hidden than meets the eye. One month later, she deeds all of North America to this guy, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, one of her bravest courtiers in war in Ireland. Give us so appreciative the work that he does. He gives D all the lands north of the 50 degree line. All Alaska, Canada, and Greenland went to D. Gilbert got the rest, except for Florida and Mexico. They don't want to mess with Spain. So, England had been Catholic for over four centuries. And then you get Henry VIII with all of his wives. He was Catholic when he died, but then his son was Protestant for five years. The boy king, he lived for five years. Then Mary comes to the throne, and she's Catholic. And uh, she throw, he gets thrown in jail. To save his life, he becomes a Catholic chaplain. And she cuts the heads off the 300 bishops, by the way, Bloody Mary. And so Dee survived that. And, uh, and then Elizabeth comes to the throne, and she's Protestant again. Well, if you didn't change when you went back and forth, you got lost it. So uh, he becomes her philosopher, and uh, he's asked to select the date for her coronation, which he does, January 15, 1559, but the Catholics are being persecuted. They said, anyway, a Catholic who didn't attend the Church of England was fined 20 pounds a month, thrown into prison if they couldn't pay. So all the Catholics were taking their money, moving to the continent, because they were the wealthiest people. So Walsingham had a plan. He said to Sir George Peckham, one of the wealthiest Catholic, Catholic sympathizers, if you fund Sir Humphrey Gilbert's expedition, all the Catholics are settled in that colony, and the New World cannot complete freedom of religion. It was to be an Anglican colony, the first colony, but the, uh, the, uh, the Catholics could worship as they pleased. Unheard of. This was a place for uh, a utopia. Uh, but Peckham wasn't quite sure. So he goes over to Dee's house. We know that because Dee left the diary. He tells us the exact time. 3.30 in the afternoon, June 21st. And he says, do you sure about Spain doesn't know the whole coast? And Dee says, no, look, here's my map that I've drawn. This is John Dee's map of 1580. This is Florida, Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Ruba, Curaçao, Bonaire, Bermuda, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, down to Montreal. And he says, this is where you want to go, this triangular island called you know, Block Island, a little island off the coast here, and, and, uh, and at 42 degrees, just north, he says, you'll find this beautiful bay, best bay on the entire east coast. Why did he know? Verrazano had written about it. So we know all this because in 1934, they found this deity in the, in the Elizabethan state papers. Just one through here. There it is right here. Uh, between Sir Henry Gilbert, and wrap this up, uh, in 1583, uh, all that river report called by Master John D. the D River, which by the description of Arizona lies at 42 degrees, mouth open to the south, a half a league broad, and then it goes northeast for 12 leagues, makes a bay 20 leagues of circumference, which is five small islands. Perfect description of Narragansett Bay. Um, it, it's a 42, and then it goes up, and then a five island. This has been known since 19... So the whole calling would take up a half of what is going to get most of Rhode Island. This has been known since 1934 when they found the D. It was written about in the Rhode Island Historical Society uh, Collections Journal, the D River, 1583. And David Beers Quinn wrote about it in 1971 in English Discovery of America. To Samuel Elliott Morrison, these are the two greatest explorers, uh, writers on Elizabethan history, and not one Rhode Island historian has ever written about it since 1934. Huge effort to colonize the new world by the people whose language we speak, building nobody knows who built, nobody ever pieces it together. Why? I mean, we don't study Rhode Island history. So what happened? Sir Humphrey Gilbert comes across with 288 men and five ships. He makes it as far as St. John's in Newfoundland, but coming down the coast, he drowns. His mission got voided. His deed to North America voided. Deed, deed, meant everything was voided. Um, and so they said, well, he couldn't have built the tower, Jim. He never made it here. It's true. They, the record, you can read it online. But a year earlier, a year, a year earlier, 1582, he had sent a preliminary expedition, expedition of two ships and 80 men on the leads for Anthony Brigham. They came here for nine months. We know that. And I claim they came here, built this tower, ready for Sir Humphrey, but he never came. And so they abandoned it. They went back home. He talked to Walsingham about, quote, the discovery of America. And a year later, the Queen deeded in 1584 all of North America to Sir Humphrey Gilbert's younger half-brother, who you have heard of. His name was Sir Walter Raleigh. Raleigh. Very good. Made the expeditions to Roanoke Island in 1584-57. Everyone's heard of him. 
but nobody's ever heard of Gilbert because he didn't make it past Maine. And we're Americans, if you don't make it past Maine, forget about it. We don't have Canadian history. So I went up to Canada, and sure, right in the middle of town, in this commanding spot. Sir Humphrey Gilbert took, took possession of 1583, took possession of this newfound land, that's what they called it, for Queen Elizabeth, thereby founding Britain's overseas empire. He's on stamps, he's famous. But he never, he stayed there for two weeks to pick up some burgers. This is where he was headed. But anyway, uh, I found out that uh, sir, uh, in 1583, uh, John Dee was asked by the Queen whether she should change the calendar in England, and he wrote this 60-page treatise because he knew all about the calendar, about the whole thing. And he even says uh, that uh, architects should need to study optics, astro astronomy, and geometry. Regarding optics, I mean the lights of heaven are well led in the buildings from certain quarters of the world. That's exactly what Penn Hollow found. There's a guy talking about alignments. And he says that, um, that uh, you won't understand how to keep, uh, keep clocks accurate enough until you understand this, this one excellent uh, thing he calls a perpetual motion. Well, he, he's talking about the camera obscura, and why doesn't he talk about it and really explain it? Well, not only do you see the solar disk moving across the floor in the camera obscura, you also see everything that's going on outside. Oh, we were over at Dee's house, and he closed the doors, and we saw it. Everybody outside was walking on the wall. Yeah, we all saw it. You get your head cut off. So, do you have to write cryptically about it? That's what these two books are about. This is called the uh, pre Preparatory Aphorisms. This is his most cherished work, the Monas Hieroglyphica, sacred symbol of oneness, 24 theorems. He summarizes everything into one giant chart. Thus, the world was created. And uh, and, and this chart uh, uh, he explains his whole cosmology, his mathematical cosmology. Well, I got a copy of the book and translated it from Latin into English, and, and I figured out what John Dee was talking about. He invents this symbol called the Mona symbol, which has the moon, the sun, the cross, the elements, and the symbol for Aries in it. And he's very specific. It has to be exactly these proportions, the whole thing. And so I had it to, at the very end of the book, he says that his whole cosmology boils down to one number, 252. He says, if you can figure out 252, you figure out the whole book. Well, I figured out 252. I figured out the whole book, and inside this book I found... <gasps> A hidden blueprint for the tower that's across the street. Size, proportion, dimension, the whole thing. Oh. That's going to take you another day because you don't have a lot of time, but I'll tell you, uh, I had a tool to figure out 252 that people didn't have in the 1800s and 1900s when they first started translating the book. What was it? Abacus? Slide rule? No. You know how I figured out 252? How? Oh. I Googled it. Oh. <laughs> when I Googled it, guess who shows up? Come on in here. I got one minute left. <laughs> This guy shows up, Buckminster Fuller, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century. Buckminster Fuller invented the geodesic dome. You go down to Walt Disney World in Florida, the dome is all made out of triangles, the whole thing. Well, what he found in 1983 when he wrote these two famous books, Synergetics 1 and 2, about geometry, about number, specifically about prime number, it was the exact same thing that John Dee learned about geometry, number, and prime numbers in the 1950s, in the, excuse me, in the 1500s. So once I figured out what Bucky was talking about, which involves this, uh, this shape, basically, if, uh, if you have one sphere, exactly 12 spheres fit around it perfectly, and they make this shape, it's called a cube octahedron, and it's made out of uh, square, square faces and triangular faces, and it's basically made from four of these. These are two tip-to-tip -tip tetrahedra, the basic building block of universe, but it's inverted because it has oppositeness, it has two sides to it, and four of these combined make this shape here. Well, if you make another layer on top of the 12, this 42, and then 92, and then 162, and the fifth layer close, also always has these triangular square faces, the fifth layer has... 252 spheres, exactly these number. If you take the number 12 and, and, and find its opposite, 21, flip it over, it, 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 it makes 252. 2,520 is the lowest number divisible by all the single digits, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And the opposite of 2,520 is 252. What's it got to do with the tower? Well, what I'm going to show you here is that, is that uh, yeah, you can stand right there, it's okay. This shape here, which is also the basis of all this geometry, is also the basis of the camera obscura. This is what Jim Egan says, that's me. The most economical way to depict behavior of light in a camera obscura is two tip-to-tip -tip tetrahedra. D explains this. This is how light works. If you have an upright triangle on one side, it's inverted on the other. All the light rays crisscross through.
So Dee's book is a series of riddles. Uh, I won't get into the riddle, but you have to understand uh, that I studied uh, Elizabethan history, Rhode Island history. That's about um, a tenth of my library, all those books in there. Here at the hidden blueprint for the tower, which I can't explain without enough time, but basically uh, this is what they think the tower originally looked like. Uh, and these are the, the pillars. This would be an entablature. The whole thing was plastered over, covered over, and painted over. And, and on the top would be a dome. And inside the dome, I claim, would be the dome room. The camera obscura sold it as calendar room. The whole building is a horologium. A building keeps track of time. You might say, oh, pretty fancy, Jim. Where do you get that? He tells us his two favorite architects are Vitruvius, who wrote ten books on architecture, the Roman architect, and he talks all about circular temples, and they built them in the Renaissance. You can still go to Italy and see the Tempietto. And his second favorite architect was Leon Battista Alberti, who wrote ten books on architecture. And they all talk about uh, putting beautiful proportions in architecture. So he says, what's, not, what's important is not what you make it out of, but the proportions itself. And the proportions of the tower are, anyone get it? I know I'm going fast. The Mona symbol. That is the blueprint for the tower, though. It puts them right in front of it. You say, you know, on this tower, is on this side, you'll see this, this uh, shape, the round reddish rock. I claim that is a representation of the Mona symbol. And inside, you have this, uh, the egg-shaped rock that gets illuminated on the winter solstice. Look at the front cover of his book. There's the egg-shaped rock, and there's the winter solstice right there. Now, his book is a series of riddles, and one of the riddles has to do with the uh, camera, uh, with, with this guy. It looks like a little stick figure, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's got one eye. Why has it only got one eye? Well, it's like a camera obscura, like a cyclops, a model of vision, a thing that's a camera, a calendar, and a clock. And that's what Dee was doing in 1583, not only building this, but resettling the clock in England. And, and so... Uh, this, uh, this, this has several clues that he leaves to it. You know, I won't say, you know, might say, well, Jim, you're making all this up. Well, in his, in his book, he says, that's A, that's B, that's C, D. Look what letter he uses. The letter I. Homonym oh, of the word I. He also taught Greek, and he knew the word cyclops was, uh, was made from two words, cyclos and ops, circle and I. So he makes all these riddles in the book. I, I can't go over them all right now, but come on through here, and I'll talk you down. He, his, his name was John Winsome Jr., and his most favorite thing was the Monas Hieroglyphica. They loved D back then. Why did the first governor lie? For reasons. This was a Catholic colony. They didn't like Catholics in, pro in colonial New England. Secondly, uh, the... Uh, the uh, if he bragged about it and said, oh, that was a Gilbert and a Peckman's paid for that, well, they make a deal back in London. They say, oh, that building's still there. That's our land. You've got to get out of here. Reason, yeah, third reason is, is a camera obscura going on inside. These witchcraft times. You didn't have it. Fourth reason, and then I'll let you go. John D. wrote down everything in his book. Look, and as he was did all of his books, guy comes knocking on the door, Edward Kelly. Kelly says, I know how to talk to the angels for you. And so D uh, hires them as a scribe. They go across uh, Europe together uh, holding seances. And D says, I never saw the angels, but I believe Kelly wrote down everything in, it, in, his, in, in his diary. And he buried his book in his backyard, four feet underground. An antiquarian found the book in, in 50 years later, published it, what happened between D and some spirits. But now, we didn't talk to spirits anymore. We were scientific revolution, we were Puritans. D has been thought of as this crazy guy that talks to the angels, all of his statesmanship, his mathematics, his geometry, his timekeeping, all of that whoosh, thrown out the window. Benedict Arnold, first governor of Rhode Island, because of his name, whoosh, thrown out the window. You throw these two guys out of your history books, you all know anything about who built the tower. I got so excited about it, I wrote these eight books, I couldn't get anyone to read it. I summarized it all in this one book called Elizabeth in America, I saw for $40 sign. Since then, I've written a book a year. This the most fabulous story, and someday, it'll make World Heritage Site yeah. right here. Then you yeah. the whole thing.